Welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're jumping into this really strange, unfinished story from the 17th century that, and this is the wild part, basically predicted our modern world. It's all about these lost sailors who stumble upon a secret society that's completely powered by science. All right, so let's just get right into it. What if I told you that a book written way back in 1623, I mean, think about that, the world was still lit by candlelight. What if that book described technologies that we wouldn't see for hundreds of years? It sounds totally impossible, right? But that's exactly what Francis Bacon did in his book, New Atlantis. First up, submarines. And he's not just talking about some fantasy. He specifically says for brooking of seas, which means they could actually navigate and survive deep underwater. Now get this. This was written 250 years before the first military submarine was even a thing. That's just an insane leap of imagination. Then there's human flight. And I love how he humbly calls it just some degrees of flying. But the very concept of a man-made machine, you know, a controlled machine soaring through the sky, that was pure science fiction in the 1620s. That was the stuff of myths, not a serious look into the future. And this one. This one sounds a lot like telephones or some kind of advanced audio tech. You have to remember, this was an era where the fastest way to send a message was literally on horseback. So the idea of sending sound instantly through these long, strange pathways, that was a totally radical, mind-bending concept. And if that wasn't enough, he even gets into what sounds like a form of genetic engineering, creating totally new species by artificially mixing and matching different kinds. And these new creatures could actually reproduce. So the big question is, where on earth did these incredible, almost prophetic ideas come from? Well, to figure that out, we've got to join the characters in the story. Okay, so the story itself kicks off with this crew of European sailors. They are completely lost, they're starving, and they're stuck in the uncharted waters of the South Pacific. They've literally sailed right off the edge of their maps. So they've been at sea for over five months, and things are getting dire. Their food is gone. They are, in their own words, in the greatest wilderness of waters in the world. And just when they've given up all hope, just when they're preparing for the end, they see it. Land. A mysterious, unknown island they'll soon learn is called Benzalip. But the people of Benzalem, they aren't just waiting there with open arms. They're organized, they're humane, but they are super cautious. They offer help, but from a distance at first, and they make the sailors follow these really strict rules. You see, they were worried about foreign diseases, and they even made the crew swear an oath that they weren't pirates before they would even let them ashore for quarantine. Okay, and there's this one tiny moment that reveals something huge about their society. When the sailors try to pay a government official, you know, slip him some gold for his help, the guy just smiles. He refuses the money and says this. What that means is that public servants were paid a salary and bribery was just a completely foreign concept to them. That one little detail tells you this is a society built on some serious integrity. It doesn't take long for the sailors to realize they've stumbled into something incredible a highly advanced and deeply virtuous Christian society that has been totally hidden from the rest of the world for almost 2,000 years, a place dedicated to morality, to family, and most importantly, to knowledge. So one of their most important traditions is called the Feast of the Family. It's this huge public celebration, and it's all paid for by the state. This whole ceremony is basically a window into what this society values above all else, family, legacy, and social harmony. And this isn't just some big party. It's a social machine. The patriarch of the family acts like a judge and a counselor. The king himself sends a charter recognizing the family's contribution, and the whole thing ends with a personal blessing for every single descendant. It's all about order. But the real secret to Bensalem's peace and prosperity? That was still a mystery. Until, that is, the sailors learned about its greatest institution, it turns out the secret to Bensalem's success is this massive research institution called Solomon's House. It's described as the noblest foundation that ever was upon the earth. It's not just a building. It is the lantern of the kingdom, the engine that drives their entire civilization. And here's the crucial part. It's mission statement. It's really a two-part goal. First, the knowledge of causes and secret motions of things. That's pure science, just understanding how everything in nature works. And second, the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the affecting of all things possible. That is applied science and technology. 
This is Bacon's revolutionary vision for what science could and should be. And just look at the scope of their work. Solomon's house isn't just one lab. It's this huge organized collection of facilities for pretty much every field you can imagine. They have places for manipulating light, sound, and motion. They even have entire parks for biological experiments, for creating new species. It is, for all intents and purposes, the blueprint for a modern research university. But what's really revolutionary is how they do it. The scientists at Solomon's house aren't just a bunch of lone geniuses working in isolation. No, they're organized into this clear system that looks a whole lot like the modern scientific method. They have people who are explorers, gathering data. They have researchers doing experiments. They have engineers finding practical uses for discoveries. And then they have theorists who turn all that knowledge into universal laws. It's a systematic, collaborative engine for creating knowledge. Okay, so remember, New Atlantis was just an unfinished story, a piece of fiction. So how did this imaginary utopia end up having such a massive impact on our actual, real world? Well, this fictional institution basically laid out the entire blueprint for how modern science should work. It pushed for these radical ideas like state-funded research, collaborative teamwork, and this central belief that the whole point of science is to improve human life, the relief of man's estate, as Bacon put it. These are the absolute cornerstones of scientific progress that we live by today, and he imagined them all 400 years ago. But there's a catch, and it's a big one. Bacon adds this really fascinating, complex layer. The scientists of Solomon's house, not the government, not the public, they are the ones who decide what humanity is ready to know. They take an oath of secrecy to keep certain powerful discoveries hidden. And that just raises this huge ethical question about who should really be in control. And that brings us right back to today with a final and honestly pretty provocative thought. The questions Bacon was wrestling with 400 years ago about the power and the ethics of science well, they're more relevant now than they have ever been. In an age of AI, gene editing, and autonomous weapons, who gets to decide which technologies get unleashed on the world? It's the same question his utopian vision forces all of us to confront right now. <laughs>